Hello everyone, hope you're well. This video is going to be part of the ecology topic 4.7.4 Trophic Levels in an Ecosystem. This is a triple biology content section. So if you're learning combined, whether it's high or foundation, you do not need to look at this video. So earlier in the ecology topic, you should have looked at communities, ecosystems, and the term interdependence. Now, for us to understand what trophic levels within an ecosystem is, we need to go back to key stage three and look at a standard food chain. Now, written here, a food chain that starts off with a tree and has a giraffe and a lion in it. Now, I've written them all in the same line, but I'm going to put an arrow between the tree and the giraffe and an arrow between the giraffe and the lion. Now, the arrow, and especially the direction of the arrow, is very, very important. Now, what we need to show is this arrow coming from the tree, going to the giraffe, and from the giraffe, going to the lion. Now, the reason why we must do the arrow in that direction is because the arrow tells us two things. The arrow tells us which organism is getting eaten by which other organism, and it also tells us the direction of energy transfer. So in terms of trophic level, the word trophic means feeding. So, again, thinking back to the food chain, what is our tree supposed to be in our food chain? The tree is supposed to be something called the producer, which is supposed to make its own food. Now, the only two examples of producers that we need to know of is plants and algae. Both of them are producers because they make their own food. How do they make their own food? Through the process of photosynthesis, which you learn in Bioenergetics, topic four. So, our giraffe, our giraffe is supposed to be eating the tree or parts of the tree. So what are we gonna call our giraffe? It's our primary consumer. It's the first organism that eats another organism. Now, because this giraffe is supposed to only eat producers or plants, we're calling it a herbivore. So herbivores are animals that only eat plants. The lion is supposed to be eating the giraffe. So the lion is going to eat the primary consumer in this case. So we're going to call the lion the secondary consumer. Now, because the lion isn't eating the plant directly, it's eating another meat-containing uh, meat organism, we are calling the lion a carnivore. So, you can see we've got three parts of our food chain here. So, where does the trophic levels come in? Well, at the start of the food chain is where we're going to begin our first trophic level. So, where the producer is, in this case the tree, is trophic level number one. The giraffe needs to be the next highest trophic level. So it's gonna be trophic level two, whereas the lion would be trophic level three. So what we've just shown are three organisms, three trophic levels. Now let's look at another example. We've got plants, which are a producer, we've got ladybird, which gets eaten by a spider, the spider gets eaten by birds, and the birds get eaten by a fox. Now, using our previous example, we should realize then that the plants are the producer, the ladybird is a primary consumer, the spider would be the secondary consumer, because it's eating the primary consumer, which is the ladybird in this example. So what would we classify the birds as? The birds would be something we call the tertiary consumer, which eats a secondary consumer. That means in terms of our trophic levels, our tertiary consumer or our birds would be trophic level four. Now, this is something that is not in your specification, but what would the fox be considered? It would be considered a quaternary consumer. Now we don't see many of these, and later on in this video, I will explain the reason why there are not many quaternary consumers that exist. Now, quickly going back to the previous example of tree, giraffe and lion. Because there is no organism that eats a lion or there are no predators for a lion, 
we can classify the lion as being top of its food chain so we can also call it an apex predator because there are no other organisms to consume this lion so within both of the examples that i've shown you there's feeding being taken place so this is where our trophic levels are coming in now there is one other type of organism that carries out feeding and they're called decomposers and you looked at this earlier in the ecology topic when they were looking at the section called decay and related to your required practical or fresh milk so again what are decomposers they break down dead matter using enzymes to digest it now once it's digested any of these small molecules that are soluble can get diffused into the microorganism to help it to grow and carry out the decay process of course remember from key stage three that a food chain is a very simplistic way of representing the relationships between organisms in an ecosystem the real way that we could show this would be with a food web where there is a complete network of relations between different organisms Now, we can also represent this relationship in something called pyramids. Now, the first one that we're going to look at is a pyramid of numbers. Now, what does this mean? So if we go back to the first example I gave you, a tree, giraffe and a lion. What our pyramid of numbers tells us is how many individuals of each organism do we have? So let's say, for example, that we had one tree, we had 20 giraffes, and we had 10 lions. So 20 giraffes feeding off one tree, and then 10 lions consuming 20 giraffes. How would we represent this in a pyramid of numbers? Well, using a pyramid, the length of the bar is supposed to be equal to the number of individuals. So we need to show a bar to represent one tree. So it would be quite small, like so. We would have to do a longer bar for 20 giraffes, because that's the highest number that we have. And then we'd have to do a smaller bar than giraffes, but a larger bar in terms of its length than, uh, than tree, sorry, for our lions. Please note, when we're doing these pyramids now, you can see that it's not the height of the bar which is important, it's the length of the bar which is very important. Now, you can already see that this does not follow a typical pyramid shape, but it could in another example. So if I were to give you another example, I can make it out so you have a standard pyramid shape for a pyramid of numbers. Okay. Now, the other way in which we can use pyramids to show a relationship in a food chain or trophic levels is with a pyramid of biomass so let's define the word biomass biomass can be defined as the amount of living material in an organism now where does this living material come from this living material can be carbon now in humans and in other organisms carbon is going to be present in a high amount or high abundance carbon for example is in our skin carbon is in the tissues that make up our muscles where do we get that carbon from the food that we eat and the main source of carbon for our energy is through glucose so what does the pyramid of biomass tell us it tells us how much living material is at each trophic level. So using our lion, giraffe and tree example again, let's say that we have one tree. Each one of the leaves on that tree contributes to the biomass. So let's say that this one tree had 200 leaves on it. Every single one of those leaves contributes to the biomass. So that should mean there is a high amount of biomass coming from the tree. 
if we have 20 giraffes, we only have 20. So each one of those 20 giraffes contributes to its biomass. So thinking about the leaves on the tree plus the bark on the tree, everything in that tree contains carbon. So all of that will contribute to the biomass where for our 20 giraffes, it would be much less. Then we have 10 lions. So that should be considerably less than our giraffes and our tree. So now you can see by forming our pyramid of biomass, we're getting our standard typical pyramid shape. Now, think about what we did just a moment ago. Can we add trophic levels to this pyramid of biomass? Yes, we can. So where would trophic level one be? It would be at the bottom of the pyramid. Trophic level two would be just above and trophic level three would be at the top. So from our specification, it says, students should be able to construct accurate pyramids of biomass from appropriate data. So that means two things. In a question, you could be given some data and you need to draw your pyramid of biomass. However, the word accurate tells you something. It tells you that your pyramid of biomass needs to be to scale. And if it means to scale, that means that you need to use some graph paper. So let's look at an example right now. Okay, so here is our example of constructing a pyramid of biomass. So let's look at the information that they've given us here and then try to figure out how to do this. So at the top, it's given us a food chain. It's told us that the grass has a biomass of 4,500 4, kilograms, our cows has a biomass of 1,000 kilograms, and our humans has a biomass of 250 kilograms. Okay, so remembering our pyramid of biomass that I did before, it should always follow our pyramid shape, and we should remember that 10% of biomass from the previous trophic level is available for the next trophic level. So you can see that our biomass is decreasing as we go up the food chain. Uh, on the right hand side now, we've got a little key and it tells us um, that our grass is green, our cows, the bars would be red and for our humans, the bars would be blue. The last piece of information they tell us now is how much of each of these full squares is equivalent to in terms of biomass. So each full square is 250 kilograms and each half square would be half of that, so 125 kilograms. So how are we going to use this information to construct this pyramid of biomass? Well, if we take grass first, it's 4,500 kilograms total. But if each full square is 250, we just need to divide 4,500 by 250 to tell us how many of these full squares we need to draw. So doing 4,500 divided by 250, you should get 18. So we need to select grass and we just need to do 18 full squares. Remember, it's not going to be vertical. It needs to be horizontal. So let's do that now. Okay, so we've got our 18 bars for our grass. So what would be next? The cows. So 1,000 kilograms divided by 250, we should get four. So let's put four right above our grass now. Okay, perfect. Obviously, we should be trying to do this somewhere in the middle to try and represent a pyramid. And lastly, our humans. So it says 250 kilograms. So of course, dividing 250 by itself should get one. So we just need to do one full square for humans. Okay, so let's check that and see if it's right. And it's fine. Okay, so that is how you use a pyramid of biomass. Now, if this was an exam question, what they're going to ask you probably to do is to label your pyramid of biomass, because obviously you won't be using colours in your exam. So you need to make sure that you label 
your pyramidal biomass accurately. So they probably ask you to label it with the organism or to label it with the trophic level. So obviously in this example here, the grass would be trophic level one, cows would be trophic level two, and humans would be trophic level three. Here's another example for you to try. So I suggest that you pause the video and have a go at it. I'll show the answers in a moment. So looking at the answers for this second example now, we've got dead leaves 1500 kilograms, earthworms 500 kilograms and hedgehogs 250 kilograms. And again, just like before, each square is worth 250 kilograms in terms of biomass. So using our division, we should have for our dead leaves, it should be six full bars, full squares, sorry. For our earthworms, it should be two. And for our hedgehogs, it should be one full square. Now, obviously, what they've done here to make it look kind of symmetrical is they've put the hedgehogs into each half a square. So, of course, 125 plus 125 should give you 250. So, it should be equivalent to one full square. Now, our last section is called transfer of biomass. So if we look back to our previous example, tree, giraffe and lion, we said right at the beginning of this video that the arrows should be to the right always. And these arrows represent the direction of energy transfer. Now, now that we've learned what the term biomass means, we can now say that it's actually the transfer of biomass between each trophic level. Now, we have to really think about how much biomass is transferred between these trophic levels. So let's think about the tree. Where does this energy come from so that a tree can transfer energy and biomass to a giraffe? Well, because it's a plant, the energy needs to come from the sun in the form of light. Now, we need to understand that not all of the energy coming from the sun will be transferred to the leaf. There are a number of different reasons why this is not the case, but you do not need to know these for the specification. So, what we're saying is out of all of the light that's available in from the sun, which could be 100%, we could say, only about 1% is taken in by the leaves, or by the plant, or by the producer. Now, from that 1%, how much gets transferred to the giraffe? or how much is available for the next trophic level, is another way of saying it, it is around 10%. So 10% of that energy that the tree has available to it is able to go to the next trophic level. So in this case, able to go to the giraffe. So the question is, why is it only 10%? Well, thinking about the tree first, the tree needs to carry out certain processes to enable it to survive. One of the main ones is respiration. And if you remember the formula for respiration, it's glucose and oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And respiration can be defined as the breaking down of glucose to release energy. So some of that energy is given off as in the form of carbon dioxide and water through respiration. So that will not be available for the giraffe. Thinking about the giraffe now, the giraffe will not eat all of the tree. It's only gonna eat the leaf portion of the tree. So the rest of the bark and roots will not be consumed by the giraffe. And that, that other part of the tree should contain biomass. So it will contain energy. Now let's look at the giraffe itself and see roughly how much energy can be transferred to the lion. So let's say that the giraffe has consumed some of the tree and it now has 100% 
of the energy that it has available for the lion. Well, similarly to the tree, it needs to carry out respiration, producing carbon dioxide and water. So let's say that from that 100%, 30% of that energy is released through respiration and through urine. Because of course that will release some carbon dioxide and water also. Now, when you have a meal, you don't digest and absorb all of the material, all of the nutrients from your meal. So what happens to it? It gets released, ingested as feces. So let's say that 60% of that initial 100% was released as feces now. That would mean it would be a total of 90% of that initial 100% that is not available for the lion. So doing simple maths now, that would be 100 minus 90, that would leave 10%. So that will tell you that between each trophic level, only 10% of the biomass from the previous level is available for the next trophic level which is not a high amount. Now, I did say to you earlier that I will explain the reason why you don't see many quaternary consumers. Now, if we think about this 10% now only being available for each next trophic level, that would mean that when you get up to trophic level four or even higher, there's only a small portion of energy that's available for that level. And that's not enough to sustain any organisms that are at that trophic level. So most food chains only go as far as tertiary consumers. Now, going back to our specification again, what you're also required to do is calculate the efficiency of biomass transfers between trophic levels by either fractions of mass or percentages. So let's look at a couple of examples now. So the equation to calculate efficiency can be shown here, which is energy used for growth, which is the output, divided by energy supplied, which is the input. Now, this can be written in another way. It could be efficiency is equal to energy from the current trophic level, divided by the energy from the previous trophic level. And that's going to be important when we are looking at primary and secondary consumers. But in this example that you see here, it says, for example, if grass receives 1 million kilojoules of energy from the sun and uses 20,000 kilojoules of energy for growth, then, so of course, the input in this situation would be 1 million and the output would be 20,000. So dividing them, you should come out with 0 0.02, but as a percentage, multiply it by 100 and it should be 2%. Okay, so here's a question for you. A fox consumes 200 kilojoules of energy from a rabbit and uses 8 kilojoules for growth. How energy efficient is this process? So, again, using our equation, the energy used for growth would be eight kilojoules and energy from the rabbit is going to be 200 kilojoules. So eight divided by 200 kilojoules should be coming out with 0 0.04. But if you times that by 100 to get as a percentage, it should come out to 4%. Okay, so here are a couple of exam questions for you to try. So pause the video, have a try at these questions and we'll go through the answers. So, if he's asking us for a pyramid of biomass, we need to remember that a pyramid of biomass should always have a standard pyramid shape. So it should be longer at the bottom and smaller at the top. So which of those pyramids shows that? It needs to be C. So the correct answer should be C. Our next question says, some snails ate some lettuces. The lettuces contained 11,000 kilojoules of energy. 
only 10% of this energy was transferred to the snails. Calculate the energy transferred to the snails from the lettuces. Right, so we've had some practice of using this efficiency equation. But this time, they're not asking us to actually calculate the efficiency. They've given us the efficiency. So they want us to calculate the energy that is supplied to the snails from the lettuces. So what we'll have to do is we'll need to rearrange the equation here. So how could you rearrange the equation? Well, 10% would be the efficiency. So if we were to convert that 10% to a decimal, that would be 0 0.1. So if you know now that your efficiency as a decimal is 0 0.1, and you already know that the energy that is supplied is 11,000, then what you'll need to do is you'll need to do 0 0.1 multiplied by 11,000. And if you do that, you should get 1100 kilojoules, so 1100 kilojoules, and that will be your energy transfer to the snail.